We're going to get a simplest example of group theory applied to uh, a real physical problem. A real physical problem will be our coupled uh, pendulum, which is uh, sitting off to the, the left here and being projected. But we have uh, animations of that as well, so we're going to really understand the dynamics of this thing using uh, projection algebra of a very simple, the simplest, the smallest group is C2. And uh, it's inside an enormous Lie group called U2, and we'll discuss uh, some of the issues in, in, uh, involving that, uh, particularly in uh, the ones that are uh, physically uh, understandable. So um, I had mentioned before that symmetry gr groups can become uh, eigensolvers. So it's one page we want to look at that's a review uh, before we go. But uh, it's kind of superfluous because this example is so good that you really start to get a feeling for how symmetry uh, works. And we'll be doing basically two-dimensional harmonic oscillators classically I'll talk about the quantum mechanical versions of that too. We have uh, some simulations to show uh, the behavior that the group theory reflects. Uh, to use a pun, we're talking about reflection symmetry here. Uh, the first of the Pauli matrices uh, that we deal with uh, is uh, it, it is a feature uh, today as well. The um, Eigen solutions and the character table associated with that group. We're going to introduce uh, the simplest example of character uh, table, the simplest example of mixed mode dynamics and geometry, but also projection algebra that goes with it. Then we're going to show uh, three famous two-state systems. That is, systems that will map onto the simple coupled pendulum. Uh, model, and one of those is the ammonia molecule, and it's uh, a little sad because uh, today it was announced that uh, Charles Towns uh, had died, and he is one of the three famous two-state systems that led to the revolution that has allowed us to have all of the spectroscopy and stuff that I owe my career to, that is high-resolution spectra. But uh, also he invented the, the uh, maser, which became the laser. He helped in that too, but mainly the ammonia maser. So we're going to talk about uh, the beginnings of that. Uh, and I was planning to do that anyway, and then the New York Times reported. Uh, I'll show the article about him when we get to this point. Then we're going to make an analogy uh, between two-state Schrodinger equations and to the classical equations that we're uh, solving uh, for our first run here uh, with a, a bilateral symmetry, bicyclic symmetry uh, is the name of this lecture. We're going to probably need, a, 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 well, we're certainly going to need at least two lectures uh, on this, but we may be able to get into the, to the a uh, little bit more of the detail of the Pauli spin matrices uh, that uh, all three of them, I should say all four of them, uh, that uh, uh, come uh, uh, to our help in uh, solving problems by symmetry. So, review that I'm mentioning here is that if you have some sort of uh, uh, Hamiltonian, uh, that's quantum mechanics, or some sort of K matrix for an oscillator system, uh, that's what we'll be doing uh, first. Um, and you have some operators that commute with that Hamiltonian that you know from geometry that they commute, then uh, you sometimes can use the eigen solutions of those uh, matrices or operators to also uh, tackle the diagonalization problem with the seemingly more difficult um, operator, namely the driver of your uh, dynamical system. And it may even be true, and this is what we really uh, want to sell in this course that other people uh, don't do, it may be that you could show that your operator is a linear combination of, or at least the representation of your operator in a certain way is a linear combination of these things. That's what we're going to do today. Uh, there will only be two things 
but it will give you an idea how this works. This is the simplest example of applied group theory, uh, bar none. So um, we're going to do ideal cases uh, first, uh, more general, we'll be built uh, as we go along. So our first uh, thing to tackle here is how bilateral sigma b uh, symmetry uh, is an eigensolvent. Uh, how do you uh, make that happen? And uh, other things that are connected with that will be shown uh, as well. So let's suppose uh, that we have uh, the most elementary longitudinal uh, coupled oscillator system. Uh, that has symmetry. That means that uh, you uh, have two masses that are the same, uh, connected to two springs that are the same, coupled by some spring that may be a different spring, uh, possibly uh, very larger, very much larger, or very much smaller. Uh, those are interesting cases. And we have uh, here uh, the oscillator sitting at its equilibrium position, also uh, being shown here uh, distorted. Here the first mass has been moved off-center to the right. Uh, that's a unit vector uh, representing the base state, which I'll call zero. Uh, most people would think this is state one and that's state two. I want to make emphasis of number theory, namely binary numbers. This is sort of a, a classical uh, bit. Uh, this would be binary zero we'll just call it x sometimes, uh, or uh, something uh, sometimes we call it 0 modulo 2, 2 is 0 modulo 2, so you should get used to that sort of notation as well, or just a vector 1, 0, it's one unit off and nothing for this one. Then its partner, its orthogonal partner, is the uh, state which we call binary 1, or y. We're going to plot these things in x and y, so that makes sense. Uh, also, minus 1 uh, is equal to 1 modulo 2, uh, and this vector is 0, 1. Okay, so these, these are the base vectors in which we write an equation of motion that is simply uh, acceleration equals spring constants uh, times position, a Hooke's law matrix, if Hooke ever uh, conceived of working with uh, matrix equations, which as far as I know, uh, it may not have. Uh, in any case, it's a four by f a two by two matrix of four real numbers in this case, and those numbers are shown uh, here uh, as uh, involving the springs K1, K12, and the mass M, uh, which is the same. Uh, mass m, mass times acceleration would be here, and this would be a force matrix then. This is an acceleration matrix that we're putting there. So our extra extra abstract direct notation for this is, uh, and I have to come in with the camera to see the little two little dots that are sitting on those things. That means uh, acceleration double derivative. And minus, and then this is a uh, matrix, a positive definite matrix, that represents the coupling of this, all of these three springs uh, 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 multiplying uh, the position vector x uh, here. Uh, we can label that sometimes x0 and x1, or x1 and x2 is more common uh, labeling, or just x and y uh, is uh, going to be make sense when we plot one of the motions against the other as though this was a single mass in a two, di two dimensions. It's the same thing as two masses, each in one dimension. Mathematically speaking, uh, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference if we wrote equations for uh, those two, which we will do. Now, the springs can be described uh, as producing a potential in the x1, x2, or xy space that potential uh, starts at some zero value for the case of those coordinates are zero, that is the equilibrium state is this one, and then moving any one of these is corresponding to going to some point in this uh, coordinate space. And we're going to explore this space dynamically, uh, but right now it's just a picture of a bowl 
the energy is lowest at the equilibrium point, and then it gets higher and higher quadratically, and uh, we'll be working in this sort of amphitheater. I call this the uh, Bear Valley, a very simple ski resort. Uh, in in uh, when I learned to ski in California, there was something. There was a ski resort called Bear Valley. So it's bear as in grr bear, but this one is bare of trees or any sort of obstructions. This is the simplest possible ski resort that you could have. It's a, a bowl, and then uh, Mammoth Mountain has some place that's sort of like this. It has a very sl uh, gentle slope in this direction and a very steep slope uh, in this direction uh, right here. You can already guess that those are the eigenvectors uh, of this uh, uh, matrix. We've already talked about quadratic forms and that's how that comes about. In any case, if you were to do this in a classical mechanics uh, course, you'd write the kinetic energy, one half mv squared for the two masses. You'd write the potential, one half times the total number of strings uh, multiplying uh, x1 squared. And then you do it for x2 squared right here. And it's in the case of uh, this one, it's k1 plus k12, and then this one has a k2 plus k12. We're going to be doing unsymmetrical ones later on. That's what the power stuff is all about. Right now I have k2 equal to k1, but those two springs would be making that mass uh, be forced according to coordinate uh, x2, and this one according to coordinate x1. The one in between here gives me a potential that is the product of x1 and x2. And that's what comes about if you uh, simply expand x1 uh, here um, with the, if you expand the, the force that's on this, the k1, x1, and then the k2, x2, the k2, k1, 2 pushing back the, uh, uh, and, and helping this one, which is also uh, pushing back for this particular setting of a positive uh, velocity. So uh, you, you can see that uh, those forces are manifest uh, here in the uh, equations of motion which we've already uh, written up there. So that's what the Lagrange equations uh, come out to be. But there they are. Now the question is uh, how to go about uh, getting solutions by symmetry analysis. Obviously, it's going to be really nice if we can find a basis which is the eigenbasis of that matrix. So we're going to go for that just using the reflection operator. Now, the mirror reflection operator has to be defined in the basis of that we're working with here, the xy, if you will, or x0, x1 basis. But the idea is that if I make these two spring constants equal, it doesn't matter what this spring constant is, uh, and I make the two masses equal, then a mirror reflection of that thing does not change the, the, the system's uh, properties. So uh, that operator and the equation of motion, or I should say the matrix that uh, goes with it, uh, it is um, a linear combination of a unit matrix and a matrix that does reflections. That's what we call sigma B. This is what we call the big fat one. Now, um, what we're going to do is notice that first of all, a, um, a reflection operator, if done twice, gives back one. So the multiplication table for this um, group multiplication table, group product table, is shown here as uh, really uh, only four possible entries. One times one is one. One times sigma b, that's no change in sigma b, that's sigma b. Then sigma b times one, that's a commutative group, doesn't matter which order they come in. A commutative group is called an abelian group after Abel, the mathematician. Um, and then sigma b times sigma b, that's the, the reflection over and then back, it's just returning you to an identity uh, to where you started, so that's equal to 1. So what you can do, and this is something you can do very quickly uh, when you get a, a new group that's not too large, 
and the first ones we study will be two, three, four, five, six, something like that in size, is to literally calculate the, ir the, the matrix representation of first the unit operator. You know it has to be a unit matrix, but then all of the other elements that you might have in a group, we only have one other one, and that's the main actor here, sigma p, uh, you simply have to imagine what their matrix elements are, but there's a shortcut. You can just look at the group table and put down a 1 wherever you see a sigma b. And then you put down a 1, and I mean a number 1, uh, wherever you see the operator 1. Okay, so this thing is reflecting. These things are right here, can be just read off uh, from the group table. Now this is something we will be generalizing uh, for all groups, not just abelian groups. Uh, you have to be a little careful about how you do it with non-abelian groups, but it's a really beautiful way uh, to go, go at what is called the regular representation. It's regular representation because it does a regular permutation, and the regular permutation is simply a permutation of things where every one of them gets moved. I don't know what's regular about that, but that's the terminology uh, that, that uh, we will occasionally use. Uh, as we go through this. Okay, so here's, here's the situation. We have a matrix we'd like to diagnose. It's written as, written as a linear combination of the uh, matrices that represent the group, the regular representation of the group, uh, made up of zeros and ones. And uh, we know right away what the minimal equation that is the uh, uh, lowest degree equation that sigma b satisfies uh, the, is sigma b squared equal 1. We've got this element uh, in the gr uh, uh, group table. Uh, it's, it's going to tell all of the stories we need. So uh, we're going to write sigma b squared minus 1 equals 0 and factor that. That's sigma b minus 1, sigma b plus 1. We're going to skip the secular equation. Don't need it. We just use the group. And that's what's powerful about symmetry analysis, is that you will not have to usually write the secular equation. You'll go directly to the hamilton cayley equation without stopping at go. OK? So uh, that, that's a one powerful thing. And then the eigenvalues of this thing, you can very clearly see, are uh, minus 1 for this factor and plus 1 for this factor, setting those equal to 0, uh, gives you. Uh, and I'm using the full-blown notation uh, uh, for writing those things, and this is something you'll get used to later. But uh, we're going to be making a character table out of this thing. These are characters. Uh, we'll see what characters re really, uh, why, why they're named that later on. But in any case, we have a character chi plus for a plus one and character minus for a minus one uh, that we're going to be uh, using. Okay? So the spectral decomposition of this, uh, of this operator consists of, and you just use the, uh, the formulas that we're used to. First of all, we know uh, that the uh, thing has to be complete. So the projection operators that come with a plus and the minus have to add up to 1. And then, uh, with eigenvalues in front of those, namely plus for this one and minus for that one, uh, the operator itself, the sigma b, the main actor here, uh, has to be this projector minus the minus. Okay? And then if you want to flip that around so that you actually get the projection operators, you simply have to do uh, our formula with the eigenvalues, but we can look very quickly here and see that if I add uh, these two together, I get two times this projection operator here. You see I get a 1 plus sigma b over 2 equal to 2 times projection. Well, 1 plus sigma b is equal to 2 times the projection operator. The projection operator itself is 1 half. So there are your idempotent matrices, you see, uh, associated with these, you see, we're taking care of the identity and one element. So it's really not that different from the one, two, three, four matrix that we did before. <laughs> this one's a lot easier, a lot simpler. Okay? So that's the algebra. That's all there is to this 
group, really. We have now filleted it, so to speak. But now we have to put the physics uh, onto this and maybe do a couple more tricks with the eigenkets, eigenbra, they're both one half, one half. Then for the, for the, and this is a typo right here, this is obviously minus there, uh, one half minus a half uh, there. Of course, it's just, if you didn't get it the first time, it's giving it to you again with a minus sign. Uh, that, that is the, uh, the eigenbras and the eigenkecks have those components. We're going to make use of all of that. Now obviously, if you want to make a normalize, you look at the diagonal component, take the square root of that, so that's where you put a 1 over square root of 2 if you're doing. But we are doing everything by operator, so we don't have to get those radicals in, tangled up here too much. Okay, just to review what we've done. We've got some matrix we're trying to diagonalize. It's got spring constants uh, in there. They're the four components. It's a symmetric matrix. Symmetric this way and this way. That's what making it bilaterally symmetric. And we're writing it as a linear combination of unit and an uh, inflection operator. And we've discovered that the, uh, both of these operators can be written together as a sum of projectors. The projectors are this and this. And this time I've got the minus sign in the place where it should be. Okay? So the idea is K-matrix is made of symmetry operators. And in the group C2, with this product table, uh, has given us immediately a set of projectors. Well, not immediately. This is 2020 hindsight. We're we're doing this very elegantly. If you describe this, go back to the uh, books uh, uh, group theory where this started by Wigner and Weil. Uh, you won't find any of this because, uh, well, it was new. Uh, 2020 hindsight, I can see the uh, elegant ways to do this. Okay? So anyway, the eigenvalues of K now are going to be those linear combinations. K minus 1, uh, K12, that happens to be K1. Okay? And then the other uh, eigenvalue is K1 plus K12. Okay, so now we have to look and see uh, physically uh, what uh, this involves. Uh, I'm going to uh, show pictures of those things. Before I do that, I want to remind you that you can always factor these projection operators into direct notation uh, if they're not uh, degenerate, if there are no degeneracies involved. And that's what you, you get. Here's where I, that square root of 2 I was mentioning uh, comes up. Now the notation that I'm going to give for the bras and kets that are eigenstates either on the uh, right for kets or on the left for bras are bra plus, I'm sorry, ket plus, bra plus, and then this is uh, here, ket minus, bra minus. Okay, those are operators. Those are P plus and P minus in direct notation. Okay? And we can take those immediately, if you want to do stuff the standard way, and put uh, this guy right here as a, right there, and then this guy right here, there, and then do uh, the same thing with your, actually what, what I should be doing is taking the bras and, uh, uh, here and then putting the cats here. I'll indicate that in later. In any case, this is the D-tran, diagonalizing transformation of the K matrix. And there's the K matrix, and there are the eigenvalues. So this is just restating uh, what we get directly from looking at this equation right here. But if you're doing it the old way, that's uh, what you would go through, and we'll we'll do that because it's convenient. If we're going to set this up on a computer or something, I have to tell the computer how to do things, then that'll work. So here's where I'm showing you the bras in their correct place. Here's another bra that goes right there. Okay. Meanwhile, the kits, they're more obviously placed. Okay. And there's your D-tran. And there's a notation for it in the direct notation. We're being very careful here putting this thing down in all the ways uh, uh, possible. Okay. So there's the uh, kits making up the, uh, what would be the inverse 
of the D-tran. This is the D-tran on this side, this is the inverse of it. Um, this is a, a symmetric matrix, a Hermitian matrix, so the uh, transpose of this, that is the transpose conjugate of this complex of this should be that. But this is a, uh, a very symmetric situation where the D-trans its own inverse, its own transpose, its own Hermitian conjugate. Uh, we don't see that very often, but when we do see it, we uh, take notice just for the fun of it. Okay? So here is all of this notation being played out Dirac-wise. This is full Dirac notation uh, for what we're doing. Okay? We're the philosophy is you start with a basis in which it's easy to write the equation of motion and you seek by symmetry to go to a basis where the equation is easy to solve. That is, you decouple. You get the off-diagonal coupling to go to zero. So in this case, the plus and minus bases, even in odd, if you will, bases, are serving uh, to make this spring matrix diagonal. So those are going to be related to the frequencies of the uh, motion uh, that we have. And we have to be careful about uh, making all of that uh, right. We don't see the mass anywhere here. That's because we're only dealing with the coupling matrix, not the kinetic part. Okay, another way to write this thing. This is a transformation that takes you from the basis xy or x0, x1, in which it's easy to write the equation of motion and take you to a basis where it's easy to solve. So here's T, here's T dagger, it happens to be the same as T, but in any case it takes the K and converts it uh, to a diagonal form. Okay? And we're writing this out in laborious detail uh, here. Okay, so this is all the bookkeeping, uh, both Dirac and matrix uh, notation. Uh, and uh, the elegant stuff, of course, is all up in the corner here with the operators. Which lets you do this problem without looking at all this, but this is the way you would tell somebody else how to do the problem that was only familiar with the direct notation. Okay. Now, I should mention the character table. The character table is simply a sanitized version of the DTRAN. It's just 1, 1, 1, minus 1. And it should really be drawn with phasers. We're talking about oscillator here. So we are talking about uh, two phasers, and then there's, there's the, the two guys that are hanging on the board on the other right-hand side here. Uh, correspond to the phasers that we'll be looking at uh, for a coupled oscillator. Um, this is a uh, set of phasers that would turn at some frequency that we've already determined uh, if we um, you know, look at our eigenvalues properly. Uh, and that phaser, of course, goes clockwise together. They all That's a mode where they things go together. Here they go opposite. They're always opposite each other. We'll see plenty of movies of that. But I just wanted you to make sure that you see what it is you get. And this is kind of a Fourier. In fact, it is the simplest Fourier transverse in the transform in the universe. What it's doing is it's taking two points in space, two spatial um, base vectors, uh, P for position or point, uh, 0 and 1. And it's going to a uh, momentum or magnetic quantum number m of it is 0 mod 2 and 1 mod 2. That is even and odd. So in other words, going from a point that's even and a point that's odd to a momentum that's even and a momentum that's odd. This may sound absolutely ridiculous, but it's true. This is the simplest Fourier transform in the world. And we will, we will make connections that show that that's the case. But it's also the simplest example of group theory. Group representation theory starts out as Fourier analysis, and that's what we're going to be showing, um, perhaps even in the next lecture, but certainly in the one after that. 
Now, let's take, take a picture here. Top row. This is an eigenfunction with a certain m, namely zero. It's even. So what we're seeing here, um, in terms of the uh, the uh, well, I should uh, be a little careful here. Uh, when I say it's even, I mean the radii. Okay, that we're. I should say the Cartesian coordinates that we're talking about here uh, uh, go together. This is a Cartesian even. It's a a radial, if you're talking about R for this one and R for that one, it's anti-symmetric. That's because this R over here is minus the direction that we normally call positive. So if, if we're thinking about polar coordinates, okay, this is an anti-symmetric state. I'm thinking Cartesian, so I have plus one and plus one here. That's even. That's symmetric mode. Okay. Now we're going to have an oscillator on the uh, uh, actual oscillator. It's going to be transverse, in which case uh, it's it's going to be symmetric when those numbers are equal and very obviously so. So that's the one one. Here's the one minus one. This one is positive, that one's negative. So these are fighting each other. Remember, their eigenvalue is higher, frequency higher uh, for this one because the K12 gets into the act, unlike here where the K12 does not stretch at all. These two move together without affecting that coupler. Whereas here it gets crunched. So it fights back and gives you higher frequency. So that, that with that in mind, now we're going to look into the details of the um, symmetry and the beats. And I'll show you some examples of other things. So let's go back just one more time, look at the equations of motion. Okay, This is for m equal 1. I haven't bothered to put the m uh, here. Uh, here is the uncoupled basis in which those two eigenvalues are just sitting there. And these are out. They cannot exist because they're odd and even against something that's symmetric. That's another way to look at it. That's called a selection rule. We'll get to, into that uh, later, much later on. But it's worth noting a little bit now here. So you have the eigenbra and the eigenkit vectors. Uh, 1 over the square root of 2, 1 over the square root of 2 for plus bra or ket. And then the, op the opposite parity. Uh, minus anti-symmetric 1 over the square root of 2 minus 1 over the square root of 2 written either horizontally or vertically. Okay? I think that is all fairly clear. So, uh, here's the uncoupled dynamics using the coordinates plus and minus. It's just a one-dimensional harmonic oscillator x plus dot dot times mass, put the mass back in here now, uh, uh, plus k1 x plus equals zero. That's just an equation of motion that gives you uh, k1 over m uh, is a frequency squared. That is, the mode will be a frequency. Omega plus is the square root of just k1 over m. There's a k1 for each m, so it's just two oscillators that don't have any coupling. And that's because they're moving together in synchrony. But when they fight each other, then the K12 gets into the act, and now you have a square root of K1 plus 2K12, this high eigenvalue uh, down here. Uh, larger eigenvalue of K12 is not zero. Okay? Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take an initial state uh, we'll take the easy one, 1, 0. Just, I'll let the x oscillator uh, have some uh, coordinate off equilibrium, but leave the number 2 oscillator, or the number 1 by our count, this is the number 0 and this is the number 1 uh, oscillator, at, at the equilibrium with 0. And we're going to ask, what linear combination is that of the normal modes? Because we know what these are going to do. They're each going to operate at their respective frequencies. And so uh, we have to start the initial conditions that way. And this is an elegant way uh, to do it. Now, 
again, putting down sort of all the steps that are necessary. I'm doing P plus and P minus of this thing. Now, I can just do this algebraically, uh, the usual, the group theoretical way, but this is more uh, like what you're probably used to in, in quantum mechanical calculations. We're going to be doing this for more mechanical things. But anyway, uh, this is the initial position vector, 1, 0, is equal to, you can see right away that this thing, scalar product, uh, is 1 over the square root of 2, that's this times this. This one right here, same thing, this times this. So what we've got here is we're starting with a state that is a 50-50 combination normalized of 1 over square root of 2, 1 over square root of 2, uh, of plus and minus. That is this thing plus that thing, and sure enough, that's what you see. This cancels, that gives me 1, okay? Just the way we start with, right? But that's the way we're going to be handling this. We're going to be graph the projectors. You're going to multiply a state by one and then let the projectors tell us how much of each of these that, uh, are existent uh, in the what we call mixed mode dynamics. All right, so let's, let's go through this and then we'll look at some simulations uh, that show all of the features that I uh, want to uh, explain today about the physics. What we're going to have here is this guy right here uh, oscillating at this low frequency uh, uh, omega plus, okay? That's this guy right here, K1. So it's going to be operating at, at the square root of K1 over here. This guy's going to be operating at higher frequency, omega minus, okay? So I put a phaser here and put a phaser here to write the solution. That's what it looks like sum those two up and you get uh, e to the minus i omega plus plus e to the minus omega minus uh, uh, there. And then you have a difference between those two right there. Okay? Now at this point, I want to remind you of a way to factor uh, exponential sums. This is uh, getting e to the i a plus e to the i b over 2 into two factors. One that's a phase, and the other one is, is kind of a, a packet. Uh, if we were talking about an actual moving wave, uh, this would be the, the case. Anyway, uh, what I do is I go A plus B over 2. Probably have to zero the camera in here so you can see this tiny writing, realizing now that I should have made this thing uh, bigger. But E to the I A is equal to E to the I A plus B over 2 times E to the I A minus B over 2. Okay, so that takes care of E to the I A over 2. And then there's another term here that just has this thing with a minus sign. So that's e to the i a plus b over 2 times e to the i a with a minus sign plus b. So that one would cancel the a's and give me the b. Right? Well, the reason we do that, and I'm going to point to some other places where we do it, but this is the way we start our derivation of relativity in quantum mechanics. Uh, Here's the overall factor for both of these, okay? We've got this one is e to the i minus, and there's the uh, difference right here, and then with a minus sign uh, there, okay? And it's being summed, and here it's being differed. So I'm getting a cosine here and a sine with an i, imaginary factor, uh, there, okay? And that's what we, we're going to see. We're going to see this uh, when we uh, run this oscillator with those particular uh, initial conditions. Okay? And let's see if there's anything more that I need to say. I'm going to be, make a big fuss about the I phase. That's uh, what we need to uh, talk about. Okay, so here's really the lesson for today as far as physics goes. Okay? But it's also got all this symmetry uh, helping us uh, to make it an easy job uh, to write these things down in a number of different ways. But here's the uh, formula we're really interested in, a cosine of the difference between uh, the plus and minus uh, frequencies. And this is also a difference, and they're all multiplied by the average, uh, the sum over two of those two. Okay? So it's, 
half sum and half difference uh, in the f uh, argument of a cosine for the, uh, the left-hand particle and a number one particle, number zero particle, and a sine with an I factor, which I make big fuss about, uh, uh, of that uh, difference frequency, uh, what we call uh, beat frequency, uh, there. Now, what we're going to see in the plots, I want you to look for it. First, we're going to plot x1, or x, or x0, against y, or here it says x2, but um, I really mean uh, x uh, sub 1 for binary, or y. Okay? So we're going to plot them against each other while we're plotting each one of them separately versus time. So we're going to see what we call a beat wave, uh, a, a group wave. Uh, that is, we're going to see the amplitude of this thing shrink and then grow. While this one starts at zero, remember that's our initial conditions to be at one and zero at time equals zero, this one's going to grow and then go back to zero again and then grow again it's going to beat at a frequency that is uh, determined by that difference right there between omega minus and omega plus. And we've got a two in there, and that's something we're going to really make a fuss about, but not so much today. That's the spin a half. That's the weird uh, thing that happens when, when this thing is actually a spin problem uh, that uh, that half comes in. Okay, so let's see, uh, first of all, what it is uh, that we're dealing with here. Let's go and run this animation uh, for the two. Uh, I'll just give you a, a quick rundown on uh, what it's going to look like. I will, uh, I think I've got it all set up here. And you can see I'm plotting the motion this way here. It's starting to build up. You see, that's the beginning of the beat that I pointed out a second here. Up at the top, plotted with time going up, I'm plotting this big motion back and forth. Okay, so that's that's what we ultimately want to look at. And here are the two um, oscillators with a little attachment, K12, between them. And then unshown is a spring or some kind of pendulum arrangement uh, for uh, that. Okay, so we're getting here, um, because this is a very weak coupling, a very slow beat uh, between, uh, or I should say, the resonances of these things. Now here's the actual phaser associated with the lower one, number two uh, is what it is, and this is number one up here. And you can see we're almost halfway through a beat and we're about to go to zero amplitude right here. And now we have all motion in the y direction on the screen, and then if we come out and we start to return, and of course we're off the, off the scale uh, on the B plus, it is so slow. All right? Now, later on, uh, we'll look at something that's faster. I'll do it real quickly right now, just to uh, give you an idea. This one is one that beats rather quickly. You see, it's almost dead up there at the top. Bingo, that's half a beat. Now we're coming back down again and this one is about to go back to zero. So there's a beat that was completed relatively quickly because it has a much stronger coupling. Okay? And then I guess it'd be worthwhile to go ahead, since it's closer to the thing I'm actually, the real one I'm gonna show you, I'll show you um, one here where the uh, thing is really got a strong couple. Big heavy spring in between there. We're already through the beat. But this is not an approximation. This is very exact stuff, you see. And I, if you've noticed, the potential that this thing is living in, the, the bowl, the bare valley, has a very advanced slope 
that's very steep, the topography lines are very close together, and then the bunny slope, the, the easy beginner slope, okay, has lots of difference between uh, altitude changes here, lots of distance, so it's a very slow thing. So let's, let's play on that. If I start this thing off on the bunny slope, say right here, at 1, 1 vector, I gently go back and forth with my uh, two pendulums, okay? So let's come over here and look at the actual uh, thing, which is this coupled pendulum with spring attached between there, okay? And the spring is uh, sort of out of focus on the picture here, which is good because that indicates it's weak. It doesn't have as much leverage as it would have if it was down there. Okay? Anyway, what I'm going to do is show you that, obviously, if I start them both together like that, then this spring doesn't make any difference. And it wouldn't make any difference if I were to bring the spring down so that it would, had a lot stronger effect. You can see it looks more burly there, right? And uh, play the same thing. It's going to make a difference. That's not going to change the frequency at all. It's just going to be the eigenvalue k1, which is associated with the pendulum motion. We don't have a, a, a spring, instead we have a pendulum for that thing, you see. But what we're going to look at, you see, is what happens if you go the other way, okay, like this. I'll put this one uh, at um, minus one and this one at plus one. That's the anti-symmetric mode, okay? Now there's a lot of friction in this, so this thing dies out right away. Whereas this thing over here is a, not a perfect simulation, so I turn, turn, literally turn the friction off. Let's go for the advanced slope. The advanced slope is right about here. Wow, I'm back and forth in no time at all, right? So here, the two phasers are always 180 degrees apart. The two masses are on opposite sides. I need to start this thing uh, again. I, I've set a thing in there just so it doesn't run forever. Uh, we'll just run the current, okay? And then I gotta do it again. Uh, there's something uh, weird in the graphics of modern computers. It wasn't in the old ones. But uh, here I'm gonna start at the advanced slope, just again. And there you see, out of phase and fast, okay, because it's on steep slope. And it's one, one, one over the square root of two, one over the square root of two, if you want to put normalization in, right? And then there's this really slow thing here at the end of this red line. And I didn't quite get it on the right, 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 right red line, so you can see it's sort of uh, doing a little vadling down the uh, fall line there. It's a little harder to see over here. It looks just like it would. But you see a little bit of amplitude variation uh, there, okay? It's, these are the normal coordinates. There's the coordinates in the eigenbasis, plus and minus, right? Symmetric and anti-symmetric, okay? You see? And so if I take uh, the symmetric one plus the anti-symmetric one, I start here, right? And that's where I get the beats. Okay, but our beats are so quick now, They're, the beats are about the same as the phase frequency, so you wouldn't describe it as beating, just as some kind of resonance, okay? So I'm going to come back here to the... Uh, fat slow case, okay, where I start over here, which is a, a symmetric plus an anti-symmetric normal coordinate, and do a resonance, okay, very slow resonance, okay, and that means I'm going to try to uh, show that on a thing here that has really weak coupling, okay. Uh, before I do that, I might go ahead and just one more time show you the strong coupling case where I hold this one fixed and take this one out to two and let them go. 
See all the energy up top, and then it's back to the bottom again very quickly. Even bef before the friction has killed it, it's still doing that. Back and forth, back and forth, yes, right? It's going to from one, one, one ball to another one. Yeah, it, 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 they trade. Yeah, and that's what's going on up there. You see, right now the bottom uh, ball is, um, is still getting bigger and the top one is getting smaller, smaller. right? So this will do it sort of, but if you go too far, it dies before it finishes a beat. But let's go ahead and see what it'll do. Wow. D died, now it's coming back. And that one dies. Yeah. Right? So there's a real case, right? Even with friction, it's showing what we, we get. Okay? And now you get a pretty good picture from this one how that works. Okay? Now, what I want to do is eventually turn this into a problem that involves electron polarization and optical polarization. Do the latter first. And let me explain why. Because uh, when you uh, have this situation where, and I'm going to go ahead and start it over again, where I start there. Okay, so that's plain X polarization. Okay? Well, not quite so much anymore. Now it's elliptical and changing, right? And when I get to a quarter of this beating, and notice, here's the I that you see in this equation. This guy is 90 degrees ahead of this guy. This guy is 90 degrees ahead of this guy. He's always over there pulling maximum when this one crossing. Crossing. You see? Crossing. He's always at the maximum. Right? Come on, baby. Come on, baby. You see, this is the driver. When you're leading, you're giving in the oscillator business. When a phaser is ahead and it's connected to another one, it is giving to it. It will, ha it will lose amplitude if that's the only connection it has. And this will gain. Every engineer that's worth his paycheck knows this. But physicists sometimes go through their career without learning this. This is something Feynman makes a big point of. And then, this one finally dies. It's that 90 degrees all the way to the end. Then it comes out the other side. Now, this one is 90 degrees ahead of that one, right? Oh, wait a minute. What am I talking about here? This is now the leader. That used to be the leader. This one is now the leader, right? Come on, babe. Come on, dude. This is the babe and that's the dude, okay? Right? Come on, dude, right? This is the leader. Therefore, the pays. Pays. You see, this one's gaining. And you see, when they're about equal, and right now it's left-handed polarization. This is left-handed polarization here. Circular, almost circular, right? For a moment it was circular. And then uh, it's going to go back uh, to being X-polarization. And that's all due to this I that's in the second component here, this 90 degree. Uh, things depends on what the signs of the sign is, whether it's plus 90 or minus 90. And we're just about, you see, all the way, it's still leading all the way to the end. All the way to the end. It's gone, and now, now this one's leading, because this one goes out and comes back out, back, out the back door, so to speak. So now this one is leading by 90 degrees. And when they get to be about equal amplitude, this will be right-handed. Right now it's a right-handed ellipse, but it's getting very close to being a right-handed circle. I ran out of space before I got to that point. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. Now this is a geometrical picture of, those, of this behavior in action. This is the character table drawn as phasers. 
1, 1, 1, minus 1. Real axis up, imaginary axis this way. Okay, that's, that's the, the, the convention we'll use uh, for all of our wave stuff. All of our symmetry analysis. Okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a gauge transformation that simply takes this frequency to zero. I'm going to subtract whatever this frequency is from both of them. So this one is just going to sit there, and this one's going to move clockwise. Okay? All right? Now, you see what happens if I have this setting. It's this plus this mode. So I get double. This is scaled down. I get a great big double here, okay, to start with. All right? But then, these two guys move. Tick. Okay? Tick. And this one goes down uh, down uh, here. It goes tick this way. Okay? So there's the sum. It's a little bit smaller. And this one is just picked up something besides zero. This one had nothing. Okay? Does that make, make sense? Let me go one step more. Okay? I went tick and tick to get this. And then I did the vector addition. I make little parallelograms. Because we got 50-50 amplitude. Okay, tick. Tick. Alright, let's go back. Tick back. It's 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. Okay? 1 o'clock, we've got this situation. At 2 o'clock, we've got this situation. Okay, this thing has expanded. This one has shrunk. That's exactly what's going on there, except I'm taking it the geometry exactly. So you can see what you really visualize uh, when you use these phasers. Finally, here, at 3 o'clock, I've got this. Left circular. Okay. Then I keep going, you see, and I get Y polarization. We started here, we make a circle, and then we're here. This is the circle is quarter wave plate in the optical polarization business, of, you know, the filter, and a full wave, a half wave plate, is turning X into Y. That's what it does in optics. Okay. You see all the different things we're doing in physics just with C2, <laughs> group C2, the world's smallest group? Okay? So you get first the left and first the right. In this picture, uh, we came up, I think, with right first and left uh, after that. We'll see how that goes later on. Anyway, uh, what I want to do, and we've got time to do it, I think, is go through a couple of other things that we're going to be talking about later. Uh, every one of these pieces of physics is different. What I'm telling you here is that this uh, system will work uh, for spin a half. And I'm going to prove that, but I'm going to prove more than that because I've got all of this hindsight uh, build up. Starting with Robbie Ramsey, and Schwinger in 1954, Reviews of Modern Physics, 1954, they uh, did a, you know, they, they got a, co a cogent description of the dynamics, which uh, we're going to learn a little bit about today, and then we'll take that on in the next lecture. But the point is that that same dynamics, the same mathematics, was done almost a hundred years ago by John Stokes. This is Proceedings of the Royal Society of London, 1862. And in sort of a 120 year anniversary of that, um, I wrote a paper in which I put all this nice symmetry together uh, and uh, I did both American Journal of Physics and J. Kemp Phys uh, that year. And you're welcome to look those up, but you're going to see pieces of that in this is photon polarization. 
going from plane X, plane Y, is analogous to spin up and spin down. X and Y, that's what we're working with here explicitly. But what I want to make sure you, you see is that a few years after this, but many years after this, Feynman, Vernon, and Halworth in 57 uh, come up, you see, uh, in Journal of Applied Physics with an analysis of all two state systems, but the one that Feynman picks for his textbook and talks about in the paper is ammonia inversion, where the molecule of ammonia is capable of umbrella. I, I break this thing if I did it, but you see it. The nitrogen pops up and down. Actually, what happens, the hydrogens do this, and the nitrogen just sits there because it's 14 and the hydrogens are 3. But uh, that, that's the idea, okay? This is the motion that's responsible for us living in a laser age now. Thanks to this fellow. Okay, this is today's headlines. What a coincidence. <laughs> a sad one. But he's 99 when he dies. That we could all live uh, that long. Okay? But this is what he's working with. Okay? Downs and Shello. He said, aha moment. And he figures out that he can make the maser out of ammonia. Really great deal. Big deal. Okay? So, just to summarize, we've been working with two-dimensional harmonic oscillators here, classical, yet, by turning it uh, just a little bit sideways, uh, we're going to be able to do uh, the quantum two-dimensional oscillator. Okay? So, um, I'm going to do this, though, with oscillators for which I don't have obvious C2 symmetry. What we're going to do is a subtle C2 symmetry, okay, that all of these have. That's what we're going to develop over the next uh, uh, few minutes that we're here today, but also over uh, the next lecture and, and, and into really the rest of the course. This will keep coming back, okay? So, we've uh, already said that our classical system is a double derivative so this eigenvalue here is a frequency square, okay? I want you to note that the eigenvalue for classical oscillators is the square of the frequency. If you've taken any quantum mechanics, you know that the eigenfrequencies are exactly the eigenvalues at, at the energy, right? Which is frequency. So uh, we're going to be working with a system where the eigenvalues are used right away for frequency. You do not have to take the square root of the eigenvalues to get the frequency. Okay. How does that work? Well, it's an analogy that I need you to see. So we're going to go through some algebra with this analogy. This is out of the classical mechanics text the way I teach it, unit 4, so you can read more about it there, but it's also in the quantum, just not quite as, as much. Here's the deal. <clears throat> Let's start with a Schrodinger equation. I'm going to set h bar to 1, all the high energy physicists do that, along with the electron mass and charge for quantum electrodynamics. I got used to that with Feynman. Uh, first start by a 2 by 2 Hermitian, that's self-conjugate matrix. The HJK matrix. Where it's required that HJK complex conjugate be to equal to KJ. That's transpose conjugate Hermitian. Okay? How many parameters does such a matrix have? It's just four. That's the key uh, here. And it's also exactly the number of parameters that a state, a two-dimensional complex phasor state has. So here are the phasors, the amplitudes, A1 and A2, or Psi1 and Psi2. I like this one because later they turn into creation instruction operators for an oscillator. But this, what you got here, here's x1 and p1, x1 and p1, and then down here is x2 and p2. So we're already doing the picture of the solutions for this equation. It's just that we have to set up the algebra right. But there's something very cool about having the states have exactly the same number of dimensions 
or degrees of freedom as the operators that drive them. Now, I, I risk sounding like a crackpot, but I claim that that, and I'm going to prove a little bit of that indication, that the reason we have four dimensions of space and time is, is this. Okay, now, what we're going to do is we're going to separate real and imaginary parts of the amplitude. So it's, that's position and momentum for us over in the uh, 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 sort of classical model. Okay? So we're going to separate them into real first order differential equations. How do you do that? How do I turn this thing? Okay? That's the Schrodinger equation with the h bar set to 1. Okay, written in our notation with phasor x and p uh, for the two, the two states, 1 and 2. And that's Fernan, Feynman, Vernon, and Hellworth uh, connection, if you will. Uh, but I take it one step further by simply writing out what that uh, looks like. Okay, and then taking the imaginary part, which is in red here, and the real part, which is in green here, and writing them separately. X1 dot and P1 dot, okay? Then I do the same thing with the second level. And when I get done doing that, I get some linear equations in momentum and coordinate. You may not be able to see the dots on this, but uh, that is uh, what we're getting out of this, which is the first derivative on time. Okay, so that makes sense? Okay, now, then I said, what classical Hamiltonian can I design to give this result, but what classical Hamiltonian gives those equations? And this is it. And we're going to use this a lot. This is a really neat doorway to all of the Schwinger stuff. Uh, that, that has to do with field theory, angle momentum, all that kind of stuff. Uh, this is the classical age whose canonical equations, Hamilton's canonical equations, x1 dot, partial h with respect to p1, x2, h is p2. Then minus sign, p dot, 1 and 2, is minus the partial of h with respect to, now the coordinate. Bingo, 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 exactly these equations right here. Okay, so this is solid. This is just algebra, but it's what we want. This is making the connection. Okay? QM versus classical equations. They're identical. All Schrodinger problems are classical. Okay? As long as I leave this thing constant. If you don't, if, if you're changing the rules in the middle of the game that's resonance, you get some other system pumping it, then you just make a bigger system and this will return. Okay, so finally, what we're going to do is we're going to take a second time derivative so we can make a connection to Newton's equations, the Newton hook equations. X dot dot equals some K matrix times X. All right? So that's what we do. We take this guy and dot him again. That means I get each one of these things dotted. Then I use this thing here to replace the dotted things with the coordinates. Okay? So I do that for number one and for number two. It takes a lot of space, so I'm infringing on the quantum realm over there, but that's fine. So here's what you end up with. This is an equation that has the form that we were working with over here with the k components. And this is no C2 obvious symmetry, okay? Neither does this have. This is different from that, okay? But that's the problem we were solving with K1 and K2 possibly different. And M1 and M2 also different if you want, but I'm putting those equal to 1 for the time being here. That's an interesting discussion what you can do there. So here's a connection formula between these uh, A, B, C's, and D's that live in the Hamiltonian uh, matrix and the K's that live in the classical matrix. This is a pretty nasty set of equations. And to, to invert them is a real pain if you don't use the group theory. That's what we'll eventually do. Uh, so the idea is just to make the connection for now and then go on. 
Now here's a really easy way to see that connection. I can avoid all of this by simply saying I've got a quantum equation where the partial derivative with respect to time has, is affected by a matrix A, B, B, D. Now I'm turning C to zero temporarily here, but uh, let's just go, bear with me because we didn't have a C uh, in these K matrices. We're going to put it in later, but uh, right now we didn't. And so uh, I'm going to do this thing, and I'm going to say that implies that if I square this, I should square this matrix. So it's telling me that the partial double derivative with respect to time, with a minus sign, should be equal to that. Bingo. That's your K matrix. That's your connection. Okay, so this is easy. But this is so, it looks like a cheap trick. I, I want to make sure that you see it's solid. Okay? But this one works when C is not equal to zero. Okay? This is with z equal to zero. It's just basically saying the two-state Schrodinger equation is like a square root of Newton what? Take the square root of that equation and you get this one. Well, that, you know, you, you sort of saw something like that had to happen because these guys' eigenvalues are frequencies. These guys' eigenvalues, you see, are frequency squared. He's got two derivatives. This one does one. One and an i, which gives you a minus sign that stabilizes it. Okay? So here it is with c not equal to zero. I take this whole darn matrix here, square it, and I get this guy for my, um, call it Newton hook if you want, but this is, this is well beyond hook. This has got a gauge uh, magnetic thing. Okay? So, um, we're a little, a little short. I want to see if I can get through just this part. Here's the deal. Remember, I said that the main thing we're going to do in this course is take equations of motion, the parts of them, operators, whatever, and try to write the whole thing as a linear combination of some kind of algebra or group operator system. That's exactly what we're doing here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, here's the whole darn thing before we just had this guy here and then uh, this plus this with A equal to D. Okay? That's what we worked out to make all of this stuff. Okay? Now I'm going to go for all four parameters. Okay? So I'm going to split the identity into an E11 and an E22. So that's where the A and the D are going to go. And then these things that are left are the Pauli spinners. But the Pauli should not have his name on these things. First of all, Jordan was the guy that really worked with him on this. But this should have Hamilton's name on it, the Hamilton Quaternions. These are the Hamilton Quaternions, these four things here. It's a four-dimensional deal. Okay? But anyway, this is sigma A. Now, sigma A by Pauli is called sigma Z, 1 minus 1. The thing we were working with, sigma B, is called sigma X. And then this guy right here, this guy complex, is com imaginary, is called, we call it C, but uh, Pauli would call that one Y. Okay? And then everybody calls an identity an identity. Okay? So, uh, that, that's the uh, breakdown of this Hamiltonian into four things, including the identity. Okay? Now, why did we change the names? Mnemonics. Mnemonics are really useful. This is involving the parameter A and D. So it's asymmetric diagonal. That's what A, we'll just use A for asymmetric. B is bilaterally balanced. Balanced in the sense that our modes between X and Y are halfway, 45 degrees, or minus 45 degrees, 135, or minus 135, okay? Bilaterally balanced stands for B, that's sigma X. And then finally, this guy right here, C, 
complex circular chiral cyclotron Coriolis centrifugal curly that says curl of field okay circulating current carrying I mean do you have enough C's there these are moving waves this is a thing that gets things moving gives you current it's the thing that gives you the uh, weird stuff associated with circular motion circular polarization things that have chirality a cyclotron it has chirality. Coriolis, that's the ultimate chirality in the uh, mechanical world. Centrifugal is there too. Curl of the field is non-zero. Okay? And I use color too. The asymmetric diagonal and the bilaterally balanced are standing waves. They're these guys. Okay? We're just do doing motion back and forth. No ellipses, no uh, stuff that has curl or angular momentum or anything like that. Okay? These two, first of all, this one is just plain stop, fast and slow axis. Okay? The one we're working with, B symmetry, this is A symmetry, this is B symmetry, it's right in the 45 degrees. That's what we're working with. In between there is something that's anywhere. Okay? Here B is zero, here A is equal to A. Here A is not equal to D, okay, and there's a B. So that's the general real Hamiltonian, okay? But you gotta have this guy to make anything go, to make a current. Okay? So I use the traffic light colors. Go for green, slow for caution, okay, it means a little, you know, something like this, but it's still you still move and sort of because you can go back and forth, but then this is stuck. Okay, so that's that's the color scheme for this course. We're going to use it over and over again. Okay? All right, let's get a little bit of a start on Pauli operators, Pauli spin operators. Okay? We have a sigma 1, which is an identity, and then we have sigma A, which is sigma C, sigma B, which is his X. And C is his Y. And the Y axis is really important. Well, I'll explain all of that later on. Y axis gets things moving. Okay, the Pauli spin operators are, are listed here that way. This is 1927. Okay, talking about Zeitschrift Physik, quantum mechanic of magnet, magnetic electrons, magnetized electrons, like Pauli. Okay landmark paper, all right? But he borrowed all this stuff from Hamilton in 1843 and never mentioned it, okay? All you have to do is take his sigmas and put an I on them, and you get the hyper-complex numbers of Hamilton's quaternions. And we're going to take advantage of that. That's something worth knowing, okay? Each Hamilton quaternion squares to negative 1. Just like the imaginary number i squared equals minus 1. Together they make up an eight ordered group. We'll study that briefly, but we'll be using it long before we get to that point. Each Pauli squares to positive 1. We just used uh, this one, that was sigma b, some mirror reflection. You square a mirror reflection, and you're back again. Okay? So each of these acts like a mirror reflection. It's kind of hard to visualize that. We'll get, get, get to that a uh, little, little bit. We'll, we'll play with these two a little bit, and then we'll bring this guy in. That's the one that really makes things happen. Okay? So th that's a, a look at the potentials that you would see here. Um, if I simply use this one, that means no coupling no bilateral connection between the things. And that's what you see, if we could swing this over, you might as well look at that uh, motion. Uh, here it is. It's pretty dull. I've set the thing up here on a 45, and it doesn't stay there, obviously, because the eigenvectors now are x. See, there's nothing coupling them, right? Or y, right? Nothing coupling it. So that's an eigenvector, right? This one may have a different frequency 
than this one. But that doesn't make any difference if there's no coupling, right? And they indeed do have a different frequencies, as you can see by just starting it somewhere else. This one's getting a little ahead of that one, so it makes a, a, a beat. This will be making a beat, you see. It will be making a polarization ellipse that evolves like that. There's no coupling. Just different frequency. Okay? So that's the A-type symmetry that you're looking at there. All right, I think we can finish this uh, fairly uh, quickly here, although it's a little bit of a uh, stretch. Um, this kind of stuff that we'll be doing uh, later on is really important. Okay. So let me just sketch the what we want to do next time. We want to be able to uh, visualize this. We want to be able to literally write the answers down for you name me a Hamiltonian here, I'll tell you everything it does in my head. Okay? Now the idea is that Hamilton will generalize this expansion. This is what we need to do. We want to generalize this thing so I can just write the combinations of four hypercomplex numbers. Not just one, but four. Okay? Well, three uh, sort of imaginary ones and then a, an oddball. Three to do with space, one to do with time. That's when it really becomes powerful. Okay? We're just going to do, for the first go around here, the stuff that uh, is Feynman, Vernon, Hellworth. So here we have e to the minus a. I want to write this thing out as a sum. Okay? So I've got four components up there. And then I want to reduce this thing to something like this with four terms. That's what we're after. We want to generalize this thing already a, a gem of mathematical logic. An absolute crown jewel of the Euler de, Mo, de Moivre. I guess is the pronunciation for the French school, but Euler's a Swiss, gets his name on it, and that's what the E is. This thing is being generalized by Hamilton. It happened sort of in one day. We'll talk a little bit about that later on. This is some funny notation we're going to use. Those are the four terms all subsumed under a dot product. These are the parameters that we're going to work with, the B, C, A minus D, and we're going to call them omegas when we're talking about velocity, or if it's just an angle, we'll just label them with a, uh, up a, a script um, Greek phi. Okay? And the symmetry relations that make this possible for either the Pauli spinners or the quaternions, which are Pauli with an I, a minus I in front, those are the quaternions of Hamilton, those things are going to work for us. And they each square to one if they're the palettes. They square to minus one if they're the quaternions. We'll mostly work with these because we don't need the minus that much, but should keep it in mind for some other applications that come. Now, the, the idea of this is that this squaring to one or minus one, let's just do one here, this squaring is true for the components based on any unit vector, not just x, which we started with, or z, which I pointed a little bit out there, or y, which is the weird one. doesn't matter. I can have any number, a real number, uh, here. And if that uh, is a dot to 1, if it's a unit magnitude vector, then that's the A component of the sigma operator space, sigma dot A unit. It's just simply AX times sigma X, AY times sigma Y, and AZ times sigma Z. This is so that we can set up and have any linear combinations of the sigmas, including the unit, but let's just do the three colored ones, uh, defining a spinner vector operator. And what you can see is, and this will bring us, I think, to the end of our time here, uh, is that sigma A squared, which is this times this, 
is this three things times this three things, which leads these nine things. Okay, so it doesn't look like it's going to work when you first do it. But all of a sudden, one day Hamilton said, my God, this couldn't work. You write them out as XX, XY, XZ, YX, which is that guy, and they're going to cancel, and ZX, which is going to cancel XZ, and finally ZY is going to cancel YZ. I'm just going to be left with that guy in the middle. And you know what happens to X squared and Y squared and Z squared? A squared of 1. Okay? So you've got to check these guys. XZ and ZX, they are negatives of each other. They're, in fact, equal to I times sigma Y, but we'll get to that later on. We'll use that later on. Okay? So it's the anti-commutation of these operators that kills the off-diagonals and leaves you with this. So sigma A squared is 1. No matter what combination A you take, as long as it's a combination associated with a unit vector. Okay? All right, well, we're going to begin with this next time. Because we have to generalize exponential of this uh, collection of operators. Okay, any questions so far? Sort of uh, coitus interrupt us at this point because we, <laughs> you know, we're on top of the mountain, now we're going to go down. All good things. Yeah. yeah. Take time. With all of the stuff. Okay? We got to do it, obviously, that thing. Okay.